Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Yes, 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 indeed you are. Kimar Roach says he's listening to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, but right about now as we record this, he's trying to bowl West Indies into a position where we can win a rare <laughs> test match away from home. But uh, Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. My name is Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And with me as ever is my partner in crime, Santoki Nagilendron. Yeah, Mash, good to good to be back on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, episode 81. And Mash, we've got a guest, you know, it's been long overdue for him to come on the show and talk, talk about his career and everything going on regarding that. And if you remember, it was it 2020, Mash? Carter Kea, who fans of the podcast will know, wrote an article on this player and it went viral. It blew up. Joffa Archer retweeted it, shared it. Naki Wells, the Premier League footballer at the time, shared it. So here's a guy whose name is known around cricketing circles and we're here to talk about his career. So, Mash, without further ado, do you want to introduce him to the people? Indeed, indeed. And the thing is, what's what's quite interesting is th- this individual, this, despite playing for what would be referred to as not one of the big full member nations, everybody in cricket just seems to know his name, <laughs> regardless, <laughs> anyways. So, um, we're, we're here to have this conversation and we're delighted to bring on Kamu Le- Kamal Leverock, sorry, um, to come and speak about well, everything really, everything cricket, Bermuda, West Indies, Britain, USA, <laughs> county cricket, everything, T20 cricket. Um, and he's just he's just finished, obviously, starring for Bermuda uh, and ensuring they get to the last stage before potential qualification for the home T20 World Cup. Let's bring him on. Yes, yes. How you doing? How you guys doing? You all right? All good, man. All good. All good. I, 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 like I said, there's so much, that, so many different angles that you can go down here. Um, I'm, in, I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. But um, as, as I said at the top of the show, we had tons of questions for you. So I don't even, I don't even know how we're going to get into all this. But you know what? Santoki, you take this one away. So, Kamal, Masha mentioned it there. You've just come back from the T20, 2024 T20 World Cup qualifiers in Argentina. You hit a 97 against Argentina in the matches before that, the group stages. And then the big century came against Panama. Firstly, what was that feeling like to score a T20 century for your country? Um, you know, it, it didn't really hit me until, you know, after the game. Um, when some, I think Del Rey said to me, you know, you're the first one to, to actually do it. Um, and then, you know, a few tweets came in saying, um, that, you know, I'd, I'd actually surpassed the highest um, ODI and T20 score for Bermuda um, passing David Hemp. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite exciting to, 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 to know that, that type of stat and, and have um, uh, my name in the history. What was it? It'd be interesting, actually. What was it like playing? Because Argentina is obviously not a country associated with cricket, but I saw on social media there were big crowds, passionate crowds. What was it like playing in Argentina? What were, like, the pitch conditions like? Um, they were quite... Um, quite quite dusty and slow um, at, at the end. Um, you know, they, they didn't really water the pitches too much. Um, but actually, Argentina have been um, going in cricket for quite some time now. Um, and every time I've played against them, they've gotten better and better. So, um, you know, in our region, there, there, might be, <laughs> there might be a force to reckon with in a couple of years if they keep going. And um, the 2024 World Cup, as I mentioned, um, coming up next year. So um, it's going to be technically a home World Cup because it's in the ICC Americas, USA and the West Indies. The next round, four teams left. Um, I think it's Panama, Cayman Islands, Bermuda and um, Canada, yeah. Ca- Canada. Yeah, the four teams. Yeah. One goes through, but Bermuda are importantly hosting it. How confident do you feel that you can make uh, the T20 World Cup? Um, the last time we actually had, had a home tournament, we actually got through to the World um, qualifiers, so I think having that having that home home court advantage might be good for us, um, especially with with the games coming up um, against Canada. You know, Canada are very very good good unit. You know, and they're playing a lot of cricket. They've played a lot more cricket than us over the last few years. So hopefully we can get you know some good cricket in this summer as a team and and be able to to compete and if not better them. I think the the obvious question here 
whether from me or whether from others listening, would be because is I'd love to know what, what, you, what your opinion is of this. Like, I feel like the standing of um, none full member, well, no, in the context of T20 cricket, the standing of T20 cricket outside of the big kind of nations within cricket has grown and grown and grown. It feels like that, or like um, on the surface over the last pandemic or no pandemic over the last three to four years it feels like people are more aware of the wider global game in in terms of, it's taken a long time i feel like people are more aware but for somebody who plays for one of the smaller um nations have 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 you felt that as a team member and at that kind of national stage that the global game is taking um cricket more seriously at the t20 level i'm not going to try and pretend they're taking it more seriously um necessarily at odi or test level but do you, does it feel like that as a player yeah um so as players we as as players from small member nations we realize that our chances of playing a t20 world cup are higher than playing any other any other format so you know all of the attention is is pretty much going into t20 around the world because of that um, you know, how we have one spot left going into this 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 tournament. We don't have to jump through as many hoops as we did before. So before you had to go um, your regionals, your, your regional final. And then once you get from your regional final, you had to go to a world qualifier final. And you had to be like maybe top four in that as well. So this time, you know, only having to, to, to be the top of your region, then going to a World Cup is quite exciting. So with the small member nations, you get to probably see some some really, really interesting small member nations. I know, you know, in Africa, they've been playing some World Cup qualifiers. I've seen some teams that I didn't even know play cricket um, just watching on ICC TV. So um, I think it's quite quite interesting to see what what um, T20 goes and how, how it grows for, for the small member nations. Has that translated? <laughs> it's probably too early in the piece to jump to this. But <laughs> has, has that translated do you feel to franchises recognizing the growth of the game um, for the smaller member nations? So as much as there's more T20 cricket going on for the uh, smaller nations, I feel like it's taken a bit too long for franchise. And I mean, all the franchise tournaments, I'm not even talking about like your big IPL or your this and the that, right? I'm just talking about in general, do you think they're recognizing that, We've got some players that are worth investing in, whether from a Bermuda, an Oman, or a, 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 I was about to say Netherlands. Netherlands will say I'm disrespect to them, but let me say them, Netherlands. <laughs> well, do, you, do, you, do you think that franchise leagues are take, paying enough attention to, to what's going on? Or is it out, or do you think it's a case of out of sight, out of mind? Um, yeah, I don't think, you know, the, the smaller member nations get too much of a look in. Um, it's it's kind of a, a a thing where if you're playing high member nations like your your Netherlands, your Scotlands, you're easily visible because you're playing a, quite a lot of cricket. With the small member nations, we're not playing as much international cricket, you know. So, you know, building your stats and and getting visibility is not as easy. Um, so, in order for that, um, these these teams would have to literally have some really really deep in depth scouting to actually see players like, you know, Bermudians, um, see players like, you know, USA players are quite visible now, but see those guys, see Canadian guys, because there's enough talent in our region alone, let alone, you know, the whole world with these smaller member nations. So hopefully, you know, going forward, these teams, you know, get some scouts going, get, get some um, scouting members going away from where they are, you know, far away from where they are, especially you know IPL, go down to the Americas, go down to Africa. You know, you don't have to have an abundance of players. You maybe just one per one per um, franchise, and you know, you never know what these guys can learn when they go um, and take back to their countries and grow grow the sport in their own countries. Exactly, I, th I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Now, before we get into sort of your career exploits, I think let's take it back. So. Your uncle, Dwayne Leverock, um, is kind of synonymous with when most people think of Bermuda cricket, they think of that 2007 World Cup. There was obviously the moment in the, in the warm-up games when you took that catch, which was kind of like the viral moment. But 
beyond that, just how important was that for you growing up? Because you would have been like, what, 12, 13 at the time. For, for the island of Bermuda, just how important was it in terms of cricketing culture and developing the game for Bermuda to take part in that ODI World Cup? Um, yeah, it was quite important. Um, so uh, cricket's very, very important in Bermuda. You know, we have two national sports, being cricket and football, shared equally. Um, the interest is obviously leaning towards football right now because the visibility of, of, of our national team football players is an abundance of professionals in, in that uh, compared to R1, you know. Um, so, but it was very important at 2007 World Cup because um, cricket was pretty much, you know, the, the, the biggest sport for us at that time. We had a lo uh, loads of guys um, interested in the sport, loads of youngsters interested in the sport. And then you know we were watching the games on on tv in school you know full odis not no work being done um <laughs> I, I i had the privilege of actually going down to watch my uncle but my friends were back home watching the games during during school hours so it was it was very very big for for, for the um, country back home and you talked about cricketing having have being big in bermuda you played for different age groups in bermuda so in terms of like the pathway for developing as an adult cricketer. So you go through the age group. What is the program and the development system like in Bermuda? Um, the development system is, is starting to get back. Um, it, it fell off for a bit because, you know, young player interest, um, like I said, football was kind of taken over. Um, so when I was, when I was younger, we had under 13 national squads all the way through. Um, so we used to, uh, under 13, used to go to St. Kitts um, for the under 13 tournament there. Um, our under 15s used to go to Barbados. Our under 19s used to go to um, Sir Garfield Sobers tournament. Um, so we we had um, a very strong connection to the Caribbean um, with our with our junior national teams. Um, but now they we don't really have um, the money to do do certain things like that. Send our kids away to to, to play, um, get good opposition. So we're kind of trying to you know create that interest again at home and. You know, have a local league under 13s, under 15s, under 17s, but it's quite hard with with the amount of kids, especially with the amount of kids that are traveling abroad to to either play cricket or football. So there's not many kids at home. With um, with your with yourself, um, so how did when you? I guess if we go with when you was was it a case of going to university in the UK and that's effectively what allowed your i guess cricketing development to really um go that step further if it if it wasn't for that opportunity do you feel that you'd be where you are now or would you have gone a different route would you have gone possibly to opportunities within one of the caribbean nations so on and so forth um yeah i think i think um going to university here kind of molded my career and in, in the path that i took um as you guys know, my, my dad's from Barbados, so I prob probably could have went that route as well. Um, maybe I could still possibly go that route, I'm not too sure. But um, yeah, I think going to university kind of molded the way my career went and how what path I ended up taking. And how did it how did it transpire for you? So you, I think it's Cardiff, Cardiff MC, it was Cardiff, right? Yeah, Cardiff MCC. Yeah. So once you you kind of get the get the chance with Cardiff and and so on and so forth, what for you were the options post uni? Because again, like I say, given that you play for a given that you represent a smaller member nation within cricket, I, I guess it's just intriguing for listeners to know. Well, how what were the options for you career wise? And let me explain why I'm saying that. Right, somebody like a if you take West Indies now, somebody like uh, a Jofra Archer, um, a Chris Jordan, etc. Once they came over to the UK, they've they made the transition, and obviously they're full England internationals and so on and so forth. Um, for those who don't know, Shea Hope came to uni um, in in England and had the possibility potentially to have gone the same way. Obviously, went back to the Caribbean and so forth. But because you're representing a smaller member nation. When you got to that crossroads, I guess, at a younger age, what were the options available to you? Do you feel like you had to restart your career at any point? Um, just, I guess, go with that however you want. 
Um, well, the interesting thing about um, being from Bermuda, sorry, um, you're you're a British citizen, uh, mm. effectively. So um, I could have played as a local in the county setup. Um, it was just a matter of anyone taking chance a chance on me. Um, so basically, I went to trial at many of different places: um, Somerset, uh, Warwickshire, uh, Glamorgan. I've, I've, countless countless um second team trials playing against them playing with with teams and just had no luck um mm -hmm. you know i think a lot of a lot of county cricket has been the right place at the right time and i just mm -hmm. seem to not be in the right place at the right time in order for someone to to take that punt on me um mm -hmm. maybe my game wasn't at a, a standard that they wanted or, or you know maybe they had someone in the academy that was just as as good as me at the age i was at so um it, it was it was quite hard to 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 get into to um these things um i w i was hopeful that in the last two years with the hundred coming and everyone mm -hmm. leaving the counties to play in a hundred that i would get you know some some sort of call up to to a county team but they seem to be taking the the academy players in so like it's 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 pretty much a, a on a luck basis thing so hopefully you know this year I can try and 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 get something going with the winter I've had, and hopefully someone's seen seen me play um, and and remember me from before and seen if I've if I've grown or not and and take a chance on me. Since since we're on the topic of sort of franchises and and taking that opportunity, the CPL previously used to have one spot for ICC Americas players. So Ali Khan, Hayden Walsh Jr. have have take have thrived in the CPL and sort of made a name for themselves. Has it come as a surprise to you that approach has never come on for you from the CPL, considering your reputation in the ICC Americas and your performances? Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny you ask that. Um, I think it was maybe twenty eighteen. I went and played for the ICC Americas um, combined team in Barbados. Um, I, our group was Jamaica, CCC, Guyana, and Barbados. Um, we What's played that, in the Super Fifty. Uh, yeah, in the Super Fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was I was the only Bermudian there as well. Um, Delray was playing for Sussex at the time, so, but I um I had the most runs. Um, in the uh, America's team, I think I was in the top 20 of the whole tournament, only playing, you know, the, the six or eight games that we played. I was the only one to open every single game. I had like five different partners that just came up with me and didn't really hack it. Um, I've scored two fifties as well in, in the tournament. And then that tournament was supposed to be our selection for the CPL stuff. And I think it was mm -hmm. maybe two or three spots left. Um, from one in Barbados and one in St. Lucia. And um, I just didn't get picked. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a hard, hard pill to swallow at that time. Cause I, I really thought that I was going to get a chance, you know, but I, it just didn't, just didn't happen. Did, did you get any sort of communication at the time as to why you weren't selected or was there any with the franchises or CPR themselves as to why you were omitted from being picked? No, no, no contact at all. It's just, listen, it's just, it's just, yeah. Listen, we we can get you out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the, the thing is, listen on 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 a kind of serious one off that though, because um, yes, obviously CPL is the big T Twenty tournament uh within the region, but you have played at another T Twenty tournament within the region. You you, you went to the global. Um, T20, I think in the was that in its first year of its addition, um, yeah, it's and first, played yeah. played what Vancouver Knights who were the winning franchise if I'm if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, yeah. So, and maybe it's a bit of a shame that Global T20 is not really returned post pandemic uh, and so on and so forth. But we also have. Um, I'm hoping you're going to drop some kind of exclusive or something. <laughs> but we also have um, the Cool and Smooth tournament, which runs out of Antigua. Um, so th th there's 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 other options outside of CPL. So do you kind of have like a, a keen eye on some of the other options that exist within within the region? And actually, I should also point out USA forget Major League, which obviously starts very soon, but USA Minor League cricket has been growing in the last two years. So I just wonder what your views are in terms of exploiting the other growing opportunities that are possibly coming up within the region. 
yeah, so basically in the last year year or so, I've been playing for um, a team called uh, Florida Scorpions mm. in various tournaments, small tournaments around America, trying to you know build build a brand, build my name around some some good players. Um, I've been doing pretty well. I've got some notice. Um, I I may have had an opportunity to play minor league last season, but um, it, it fell through. I think um, the Philadelphia team just went with the same player that they they had from before. Um, but yeah, I've I've always looked at other avenues. It, you know, it's, it's it's a million ways to skin a cat, as my my grandma says. So I just just trying to find find a way to to be noticed. That's all, pretty much. Just trying to be noticed. And just just going back to that um global T Twenty tournament, your team um had two of the all time greats, Andre Russell and Chris Gale. Did you get to spend much time with them? What were your interactions with Chris Gale like? Did you learn anything from being in a, in a changing room with him? Yeah, um, I I tend to learn more from um, uh, Andre. Um, you know, he he kind of took me took me aside a lot because our, our games are quite similar. Um, kind of a power hitter and and for, you know decent decent pace. So I I learned a lot from him more than anything. Um, you know, he, he gave me some encouraging words all the time. You know, he tries to stay in contact with me sometimes. You know, with his busy schedule. Um, so, you know, we have mutual friends from Bermuda. He has a fr- couple of friends in Bermuda. Um, but yeah, he, he, he made, he made me feel like, you know, I could play with him or against him, um, in the future, which, which is, I'm just holding on to that to, to, to see if I could actually get there. Yeah, exactly. And we briefly touched upon your Super 50 experience. Now, it's ironic because we were talking about at the top of the show, West Indies against South Africa. You faced a lot of the players from the West Indies test side. I think Jason Holder, Kimar Roach, Raymond Rifar, Rostin Chase were all in that tournament and you were in the group. Sort of overall, what was that experience like playing against, against that, those calibre of players in the Caribbean and your experience of just playing in Barbados at that time? Yeah, it was it was actually quite good. Um, it, the, the best thing about tournaments like that um, playing for you know Americas or, or a smaller team, you don't really have anything to prove. You could just go out there and express yourself. So you know, I just kind of expressed myself in every game that I played, um, you know, and tried to learn and do better and get that one percent better every game. Um, you know, it, it kind of worked out. You know, the first game against CCC, I, I think I got fifty odd. Um, I got a, a few starts after that um, against some teams. Got a few good balls, which you know you can't really do too much about. And I think against Jamaica, I got like a 70-odd, yeah, which really, yeah. yeah, which really got me got me going. You know, it was some some I pretty much played against well, you know, one of my bowling heroes in Jerome Taylor, so it was quite good to face him. You know, so I I think I think yeah, it's it's, the, it's better when you have nothing to prove. Um, you know, you just go out there and try and showcase your skills and see if anyone anyone um, takes notice. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And um, you've obviously, you've previously, you've captained Bermuda in previous tournaments. I think in this one, Delray was was the captain. But sort of, how do you take to being a captain and a leader? And what sort of, how how do you sort of galvanise your team when you are a captain? What's sort of your style? Yeah, um, I'm quite, a, I'm just quite a natural leader. Um, in in a sense, I uh, I I take well to everyone. Um, but as as a captain, I just I just should tell my players I back them. You know, I support them in whatever they do. Um, so if, if you want to play with passion and sometimes your passion gets, gets the most of you and you, you go at an umpire, I won't stop you from going at an umpire. I'll just make sure you don't cross that line and I'll just back you, you know, you know, if you want to, if you want to hit the first ball for six, you miss cue it next time you do it again, try it again. You know what I mean? I'm just going to back you. I give you the freedom to, to express yourself. That's the type of leader I was. Um, so, and Del Rey is pretty much the same. He, he backs the players a hundred percent. So. It's good to see him see him do it as well. Just just out of interest, um, what is the and you may not be I'm mindful you might not be able to go into too much detail. So just speak generally if you if you have to. What's the kind of financial sacrifice you have to make for this? I've I've always wondered with um with smaller members. Um, yeah, I guess take me through the life of uh, somebody who plays for a smaller member nation. Now, obviously, I know you're trying to get gigs here, there, and there, here, there, and everywhere in terms of playing cricket. But even going to Argentina itself, like <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want you to tell me what financial rumination, rumin, rum, remuneration was. But even if we look at it, and Santoki's well versed on this in terms of like um, kind of America's 
nations within football. <laughs> like financial yeah. remuneration can be quite sketchy at the, at the best of times. So going yeah. to Argentina is no easy thing. It's not like you can just drop your stuff and say, right, I'm going to Argentina for the next two weeks or whatever it might be. So just how, and obviously only say what you can say. Yeah, well, I know how, you know, the Bermuda Cricket Board operate. Um, the, basically, they give you a letter for your job. Um, you give in your last two pay stubs that you have, um, and then they pay you whatever you would you would get from your job. They just mm. reimburse you for that, whatever you're missing. That's outside of, you know, government jobs. Government jobs, I think they pay when you um, represent the country. Um, yeah, you get sort of a per diem. You know, it's not, you know, expensive, a, a big per diem per se. Um, it's what they can afford at the time, you know, because our, our cricket board runs as a charity. Mm. So there's no real income other than donations and sponsorships. And, you know, it's been hard to come by sponsorships in the last few years with the with pandemic and post pandemic. Um, so, you know, the cricket board is, it's, it's, it's hard. It's obviously hard to pay players. No one's contracted. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you get what your, your job would have gave, given you, um, up to, I think maybe 40 hours a week, um, anything past that you, you you kind of have to make that sacrifice and if you have a second job you have to kind of make that sacrifice does there <laughs> is there a lot at stake in getting qualification like so let's just say let's just say in the in, in the final stage now you get the best of canada uh, Cayman Islands, Pan um, Canada, Pan. You know who I mean. And get the so that's my that's my buzzer going. So donkey, continue this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think what Mash what Mash was trying to hint was um, is there how much is at stake for qualification? So for example, if you qualified for the T Twenty World Cup, just how much would it mean? I guess from a financial point of view for the Bermuda Cricket Board, but also just in terms of being able to reinvest that into Bermudian cricket. Um. At, at the moment, you know, the senior men's team doesn't have a sponsor. Um, mm. Everything's coming coming out the pocket of the Bermuda Cricket Board, you know, kit, travel. Obviously, the ICC help with travel and, and hotels um, to up to an, a percentage at this level. Um, so then, you know, you have to put on top that wages, all of that. So it's, it's quite expensive. So with, with us, qualifying would hopefully get us, you know, some sponsorship, some more money from from our local government um hopefully some more money from the icc as as we progress further and further um and hopefully we get you know that that money used in the right in the right places to to build the the game in bermuda mm, exactly and um we've mentioned you just come back from argentina you've obviously because of the nature of sort of the leagues that bermuda plays cricket in at the moment you've obviously gone to a variety of different and interesting countries where has been your favorite or most memorable country to play cricket in um i think the six months i did in australia were, was was probably the most memorable uh, i played for a team called walkerville in adelaide but i also ended up playing a few t20s for um a, um, a team higher up called rest torrents um i was hopeful to get back to them but you know the pandemic actually struck the next year um but it was it was it was a very very eye-opening six months again to to see you know how they go about the cricket down there and you know how much they work hard and how much they train to 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 get into um the local the local um franchise not not even just the local franchise but the local first class team you know the um the redbacks was was quite hard to get into talking to some of my my, my um associates down there um even um one of the guys i played with uh spencer johnson he just um, started playing bbl this year but he's been a part of a bbl team for the last four seasons um, he had to move to go to, I think it was Brisbane to, to get some game time. So it's, 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 it's quite hard and stringent down there. I think it's only what, six, six, um, six first class teams. Yeah. When you think about the amount of cricketers they have to only have six first class teams, it's, it's, it's very, very hard. So, so it was how, quite how, interesting. How did that opportunity come to play in, in Australia club cricket? Would, did you reach out to somebody or were you scouted? How did that sort of arise? Uh, so uh, one of the guys I went to university with went down there and played. Um, he couldn't go back, so they asked him, you know, who's a who's a good player to to go. Um, so I guess he asked around a couple of the lads from uni, and I I was available to go. 
so I just ended up going down there to play. Oh, it's, it's interesting. And one question we always ask anyone that comes on the podcast, who's sort of the best batsman you've either played alongside or seen while during a cricket match? Who's the best one that you can recall? Well, strangely enough, um, when we when I played in the Super 50, playing against Guyana, um, Shandapur was still playing. So oh, yeah. it was actually a joy to, to get to get to watch him to do his work. <laughs> Um, and who is um, who is the best bowler you faced? That's a good question. Uh, I faced quite quite a quite a few really really good bowlers to be fair. Um, I think Sandeep Lemonchani might be the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was he's really really fast through the year, and you can't really pick his arm. So I think he's probably the best I faced. Okay, great. So, Michelle's, Michelle's had uh, a few issues, which is why he's had to run off the show, if anyone's wondered. But, Kamal, thank you so much for giving up your time and coming coming on the show. Hopefully, I mean, this set that you obviously deserved a franchise opportunity, a big franchise opportunity before this. But I think the nature of this century that you scored, the fact that it's a century, hopefully puts you in the spotlight. And if not, Bermuda get into the World Cup, T20 World Cup next year would definitely put not only yourself, but the nation in uh, in the spotlight that you deserve. So, I wish you all the best for the upcoming year in cricket. Thank you very much, man.